So, nice to meet you, Professor Hakeem Adi. Um, part of this interview is to, I suppose, to reflect on mm -hmm. your current situation, mm -hmm. but to also talk a little bit about your career. Mm -hmm. We could go back quite far, mm -hmm. but I suppose if we go over the last 10 years mm -hmm. or so, and then right up to the present, talk a little bit about what's happening now. Okay. Yeah, well, 10 years ago, I just started at the University of Chichester. Um, I started in 2012, so that's actually 11 years ago, just over. Um, and that was after a period of unemployment, uh, in fact, being made redundant at the previous university. So, um, when I joined the University of Chichester, I'd, I'd taken a, a kind of a demotion actually from my previous position, but um, I thought it was an opportunity to, to start again. And I, the, the appointment was a kind of general appointment in history, but I obviously specialised in then in the history of Africa, African diaspora. So I taught. I think initially I taught courses on uh, kind of what's now called Black British history, on some African history, colonialism and anti-colonialism in Africa. I taught a course on Pan-Africanism and I taught a general kind of survey course for undergraduates on, um, what's it called, Africa and the African diaspora in the modern world, which was like a survey of last couple of hundred years and uh, so I was doing mainly undergraduate teaching and uh, in fact in my first semester well you know something about Chichester Chichester yeah. is a very um, monocultural university so in my first semester that that first year course on Africa and the African diaspora in the modern, modern world that was voted module of the year by the students at the okay. university so um, looking back on that it showed the kind of appetite that young people you know young basically young white students have for the history of Africa and the African diaspora because they'd never heard of it yeah. they'd never see it they never taught anything about it in school they didn't know anything about it and they found it fascinating to study Africa, to study the Caribbean, to study African American history, to study the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain. So that's um, you know how things started at Chichester, and then uh, a couple of years later, I saw a, a headline in a paper in fact, the Times Higher Ed, I think it was which the headline was something about only three black students trained as teachers the the previous year. So that one would have been 2013 or something like that. This was 2014. Um, so that, you know, was like a kind of like a shocking revelation about teachers. But it, it highlighted for me a kind of wider problem that there were very few, certainly at that time, going back then 10 years ago, very few black postgraduate students studying history in this country. There were no, I think, very few academic historians, black academic historians. So when I saw that headline, it kind of prompted me to, to say, oh, we need to do something about this, you know, what's going on? So I, I got a small group of people I knew together, some so one of my postgraduate students, some teachers, um, a couple of other academic historians, I think, or one other academic historian, and just a few other people, and said, you know, said to them, look, we this seems to be um, a problem in this country. Let's look into it. And so people agreed, and we we did a little bit of research, and we found that. Um, what we thought and what our experience told us was the case that um, essentially at every level of school and university there were fewer and fewer 
you know, black students, people weren't coming through the system, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we found that if you, if you look at black undergraduates, for example, history is the third least popular subject. Only agriculture and veterinary science were more unpopular than history amongst black undergraduates. So that struck us as rather strange because, you know, as you know, if you go into any community, you know, setting, you know, everybody's talking about history, there's heritage walks, there's history projects, there's, you know, people are kind of familiar with or interested in history. So there seemed to be a disconnect between the community appreciation of history and the fact that young people aren't engaging with it or are disengaging with it, are alienated from it, are not studying it, don't want to study it. So we said, okay, well, let's... Um, so this was the beginning of the what became the History Matters kind of initiative. And uh, as I say, we wrote to the Times Higher Ed to say, you know, this is a problem. Someone needs to do something about it. And then we, we contacted various people who we thought should be doing something about it, like the Royal Historical Society, the Historical Association, the Higher Education Funding Council, whatever it was called, Diversity Committee or something. And we said to one of them, well, do you know this is going on? What are you doing about it? And they either said they didn't know anything about it, or if they did, they weren't bothered doing anything about it. So we called, we said, okay, well, we should do something about it. So we decided to hold a conference and invite anyone who was interested, let's discuss the problem and let's see what we can do about it. So that conference was um, supported by the University of Chichester. I think we even had a little bit of funding for it. They supported it. We held the conference in April 2015 and um, lots of people came. We only had um, people who actually had experience of the problem speaking. So we had school students, undergraduates, postgraduates, a couple of teachers, and then a couple of people who were doing research into the area. We had, you know, the place was full. We had a whole day discussion. And then we had various recommendations um, stemming from that conference, various things. So one was to establish something for young people, to encourage them to engage. And out of that, immediately was the Young Historians Project was formed um, with some of those who'd actually spoken at the conference. And then there was also a proposal to set up some kind of course to encourage mature students, mature black students to come back into education and train to be historians. Um, so there was a significant number of outcomes from that conference. Oh yeah, I'm just mentioning two. Wow. There were okay. some others that we started, but we couldn't actually mainly because the University of Chichester wouldn't support some yeah. of the other things because we also had a program for schools, for kids in school. Um, we had a, actually a filmmaking competition. And people could do it on their mobile phones. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> so that's, that was our idea then. But we couldn't, we ran it for a couple of years, but the university wouldn't sustain it. So we had to drop that temporarily. So that was, so from that, the, the MRES, that was the idea for the MRES. Mm -hmm. And so I went from that conference, I set up the Young Historians Project with um, the help of, mainly the help of somebody who's, who unfortunately passed away um, before it, it really came into fruition. And uh, I, it, whatever it was, two years later, three years later, I set up the uh, MRES again and was supported by the university, validated, set up, and we, we began in January 20, 2018. So it took a couple of years to mm -hmm. get it sorted. Um, so that's that, you could say that's that part of my career. And then, um, you know, of course, I was also writing and some books came out in that period, I think. Um, Pan-Africanism and Communism came out around about 2013 because I wrote that while I was unemployed, redundant. Then I wrote um, Pan-Africanism and History came out 
a little bit in 2018 and then they won the two other things. Yeah. Um, You've got a paperback of your latest book coming out, haven't you? Well, that actually yeah. comes out next week. Yeah. 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 African and Caribbean people in Britain are history. It yeah. came out last year. That paperback will come out next week. It's, 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 it's very comprehensive and I actually really recommend it. It's, it's a fantastic read and I learned so much through it. So I suppose let's juxtapose what you've spoken about in terms of the emergence of this Emirates, all of those pioneering mm -hmm. outcomes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. really, really positive to what's recently happened. Yeah, well, um, what's happened is the <laughs> university closed it down. Yeah. That's the long and the short of it. Um, the, the thing about the MRES was that um, we recruited, actually recruited that course twice a year. So we recruited in September and in January. So we had a cohort coming in uh, twice a year. I always, my, my concern about it was it was never adequately advertised. Um, you know, the, the aim was to, to recruit a particular type of student. It's really looking for kind of mature black students. But I mean, mature meaning you know, over 25, we could mm -hmm. say. And if you, and that was never done, really. If, if you put a course like that in the prospectus, prospectus of the University of Chichester, who's going to find it? Yeah. No, no one's going to, who's even going to think, who's ever even heard of Chichester? Yeah. Why would you look there? Or on the, some website or something? So if that is your idea of marketing, then you're not going to attract very many people. So I used to market it myself. We had a you know a poster made, it used to go on Twitter and social media mm. um, and bring people in that way and obviously word of mouth and so on. But I mean, that has its limitations. Um, and we got very little support from the university on that. Um, again, they did pay, I think one of my students was, was kind of employed for a month uh, to also go on Twitter. And we made a little film, which also went on social media and so on. But it didn't, um, it didn't, really improve things. I think the main way that we built the course up was just really word of mouth and what I did. And if I went to speak somewhere, I'd talk about it. And some people, some people got to hear of it, but of course not large numbers of people. But then there was never, there was no target set for recruitment. Um, so yeah, so we, we, we set it up. We, students came on it, uh, students loved it. Um, we produced, seven PhD students, six six of them still at the University of Chester, well, five of them, because one of them has just got her PhD. So as far as I was concerned, it did everything it was supposed to do. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. That's so. a big research output from, from that one course. Yeah, and that's in five years, just over five years. Um, yeah, I mean, and with... Also bear in mind, we're taking students who may not have a degree. Um, of course, we'd like students to have a degree, but we said if you don't have a degree, as long as you have some experience or some enthusiasm for history and you can write something, then we'll take you and we'll train you and so on. Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty good to be able to take anybody, more or less, who's literate and, you know, get them, you know, get them to train them as a historian. Now, and of course, you know, some people, you know, found it difficult because of work commitments or family commitments and so on. But, you know, the students generally loved it. And as I say, graduated and seven of them went on to do PhDs and are still doing PhDs. So, yeah, I think it was pretty, I'm happy with it. I don't have any... You know, I'm not going to, I don't have any criticisms of it or complaints about it in that way. And I don't think any of the students do either. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks it's great. So, so that's where we were, where we are when, um, 
the university just came in and said um, they were going to basically set a target this year. Um, and if the course didn't reach that target, then it, it would be suspended pending investigation as to its kind of feasibility or marketability was the term that was used at the time. So I think, you know, my initial feeling about it was, oh, okay, well, that might be quite a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> the university is going to take marketing it seriously. But I, I did point out to, um, you know, my line manager that uh, for, for a number of things actually, but one, one that we recruited twice a year. So if you just set a target, you know, how many students do you have in May, mm -hmm. that doesn't reflect the kind of annual take of the course because you're only looking at one point in the year and we recruit twice. Um, and then I subsequently pointed out if you only look at numbers in May, actually most people enroll between May and September. So it's a bit of a strange way of judging the, uh, the course and so on. But anyway, that's what the university did. Um, I imagine that if it was suspended, then you know, it'd be a whole long period of you know investigation and analysis and so on. But that, that didn't happen. It was you know, well, we're thinking of doing this, and then a week later or ten days later, an email saying, "Well, actually, the recruitment is completely suspended," and the students had had enro already enrolled because some students had enrolled. I think we had about five students. Would basically just told, "Well, that's it. Go home. Forget you know. You, we've closed." Suspended was the word, but effectively closed the course. So there was no leading or consultation? No, there was no consultation. No. Coming together no. to... No, there was no discussion about marketing or the nature of the course, the nature of the students, what we were trying to do with, you know, why the course is aimed at particular students, um, nothing of that kind. I suppose what I was looking at was from those initial pioneering positive outcomes, which will be, I suppose, sit as a, almost a jewel in Chichester's crown. Because as you know, I'm an alumni of Chichester and it was mono monocultural back then in the, in the early 2000s to now with the complete suspension or mm -hmm. closure mm -hmm. of the course. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure, but I, I don't understand. So what would you say to, do you have any idea about any reasons or why, or is that for Chichester? To well, I mean, I can tell you what the university say. The university claim that, um, and the more you say this, the more ridiculous it becomes, really. But the universities say, well, the course hasn't recruited sufficient numbers of students. Um, so, you know, you, you then say, well, the answer is simple. You know, you do better publicity and recruitment and then it will recruit more. Um, but that, so that's the only, that's what they say. But of course, if you say that without looking into really what the course has produced and that my other work has produced. Um, so, you know, as I say, we had, out of the MRES, we had six PhD students. So we actually had a, quite a big cohort of PhD students. At the moment I have 10 or had 10, if you look at it in the past tense, um, plus, probably another six MRES students. So that's 16 black postgraduate history students in, at Chichester. I don't know another university in this country, there might, might be, I don't know of one that has 16 postgraduate history students, black postgraduate yeah. history students. I suspect there isn't. And as we were talking earlier on, I strongly believe these are students who we are going to see on our TVs, in our bookshops, teaching, informing us um, within many different realms, whether it's with social media, TV, TV programs, 
films and so forth. So. Well, some of them already have books. I mean, some of them, uh, one of the students has, has, from the work he did on the M Res, has self-published already. Um, one of the other M Res students, she's just done her PhD, she has a, a book will be published by Bloomsbury very soon. One of my PhD students is two thirds of the way to her PhD. Her book on Girl in Bean will come out, published by Lawrence and Wishart, will come out in the next month or so. So the students were already published. Obviously, some of them also published chapters in books that I've edited um, because we hold you know, conferences to encourage young, hist- young black historians in particular. And two of those conferences have papers from two of those conferences have already been published. So in that sense, we had whatever way you want to look at it, if you look at it from the point of view of the sort of demographics of the University of Chichester, which is very white, you know, we had, and if you look at the, the history world, as it were, which is also in this country pretty white, we'd made quite a big dent in that mm-hmm. by having these 16 students. They had produced, they, many of them had published, um, one of them has gone on to win a, quite a prestigious um, research award. Is currently doing her research in South Africa. I mean, you, you couldn't, there's nothing to be criticised there. Mm. And in fact, the university a couple of years ago was almost boasting uh, that, you know, it got so many black history students and so on. So yeah, there's nothing, um, nothing to be criticized there and i think if you if it's a bit it's a bit strange for a university to say well because we haven't got enough students you know enough really enough black students almost we haven't got enough students coming to this course um therefore we're going to close it down without actually thinking about what the course is for what it's trying to do what it's already produced Um, And the context of the kind of whiteness of the history, academic history world in Britain, it's just, you know, what can you say about it? I mean, one, people would need to draw their own conclusions (laughs) about what you say about it. Um, Short-sighted is is the polite way of saying it. Um, So, yes, I mean, and that's the, the consequence. And then, of course, the other thing about what has happened to the course is that the universities then use the, what they consider to be the low recruitment of the course and to then get rid of me and say that somehow the two things are connected. Well, why is the low recruitment of the course, you know, why does that mean I lose my job? That doesn't make any sense because I uh, supervise 10 PhD students. I used to teach all kinds of other uh, undergraduate courses and so on. So it was almost as if this whole exercise in looking at the recruitment of master's courses was was kind of designed to get rid of me. I mean, it seems like a very strange thing to say, mm. but um, and it, there may be that maybe other people have been. Um, made redundant as a result of their master's programs. I'm not aware of anybody else, but there may be, but I'm not aware of anybody else. But um, as I say, to talk about the low recruitment in one course and to link an entire post to one course is a very peculiar thing to do. You might just as well say, you know, that the director of marketing is responsible for it, low recruitment. So then should he or her lose her post or, you know, it's just, uh, it's the responsibility of the university is recruitment. It's not my responsibility. I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm a professor. So, so all that is peculiar. And I think people outside of the university wouldn't really understand why that was going on. It's quite difficult to explain. Um, but then taking those things together, so then getting rid of me, then leaves the 16 students without anyone to supervise them. And they're all, the university has no other specialists in the history of Africa and the African diaspora. So it's, 
what you conclude is it's kind of an attack. It's a kind of a, not a kind of an attack. It really is an attack on what we tried to build, on the history that we're teaching and studying, on the students who are studying it and on the work that they're trying to do. Um, of course, it's been incredibly disruptive for them because the university hasn't consulted them, yes. hasn't even told them, actually. Everything is secret. Uh, you know, it's actually all confidential. It just so happens that it's leaked out and has appeared in the press and on TV and in Parliament and people making films about it and so on. But actually, it's all secret. And so the students haven't been told anything and they don't know how their research is going to continue. Most of them, in fact, all of them, have come to the university because they want to work with me or because they came through the MRES and were taught by me and then were encouraged to do PhDs. So they're all, you know, kind of close to me or they're people who've just joined the university to, to work with me. And now being told, well, you can't because we got rid of him. Mm. So that's very, very difficult. And, um, you know, of course, the university says they're going to replace me with some similar object or some similar, I don't know who that might be. Uh, and of course, the, the students' view would be, well, I'm irreplaceable. I can't say that, but that's what they say. Um, so, yeah, so that makes it very, very, very difficult. And so the, the impact of all of this is to, um, you know, close a course on the history of Africa and the African diaspora, get rid of the only professor in the country on the history of Africa and the African diaspora, disrupt the studies of 16 students who are working on the history of Africa and the African diaspora, completely demolish what we built at the university, which has this focus on this particular history, and then say, oh, well, yeah, but it's okay, it's just all about money. That's all it's about. Just That's all it's, you know, if only we had a bit more, a few more students, everything would be fine. Well, in the context of, the world in which we live, the country in which we live, the society in which we live, the need for addressing the legacy of the past, the need to repair the problems of the past, the racism of the past, or actually the racism of the present, the Eurocentrism of the present, the alienation of young black people from the study of history, all these things. You could say this is a very negative move by the university and for the university not to be aware of what it's doing and just say no it's all about recruitment or whatever it's just ridiculous nobody would believe that <laughs> because it's had it has this impact whatever you think you're doing this is the impact of it and no account has been taken of that of that impact professor thank you so much you're very welcome